I want to welcome all of you to the first part of our mini-series here about the Reformation. As you know, in our district, we're celebrating and commemorating the 500-year anniversary of when Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg and how that began a chain of events that affects us to this day. So the first part that we're going to look at today in this sermon is what actually happened in the Reformation. It'll be a little bit of a different sermon. Uh, the first part will be a historical context and then we'll look at the Bible text and the spiritual aspect of what changed uh, during the Reformation. And then the second part, we're going to actually apply the Reformation to our day and see how is the Reformation going. So I'm glad you can join us uh, for these two sermons. But before we begin, let's just start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, for the Reformation. Thank you for being with our forefathers. And Lord, I pray as I uh, preach today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight, O God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this sermon is titled, Why the Reformation? So we're going to look at what was different uh, back then and why was a Reformation needed. So first of all, I want us to transport ourselves from our North American context or wherever we're living here in the 21st century back to the 16th century, back to the 1500s when Martin Luther and the other reformers were alive. And we're going to look at what was it like. So the largest city in Europe at that time was Constantinople, about 400,000 people. That is about the size of Minneapolis, Minnesota in our state. Uh, so the cities weren't that big. Why? Because most people lived in towns. And in the towns there were several hundred people, uh, very small little burgs. And the majority of them were peasants. So chances are if we lived back then we would be peasants as well. Living in thatched roof homes with dirt floors, only one or two rooms, period, to have a whole tribe there. Usually they had big families back then. Uh, so people lived in, in basic poverty, what we would consider now. Well, what building was not impoverished in each town? Well, the church was the largest, richest building in each town. And to this day, if you drive through Germany or other uh, European countries, you will see uh, cathedrals dotting the landscape. Beautiful structures. Took 100 decades, sometimes hundreds of years to build because they were so ornate and so beautifully decorated and had such wonderful uh, artisanship. And let's think about this. You know, we get used to here in North America having many thousands of different denominations. Well, back then you had one legal religion. That is Catholicism, what we call Catholicism, which was Western Christianity. And Orthodoxy, which we, what we call it now, that was Eastern Christianity back then. They'd split in 1054. So by the time of Martin Luther, they'd been separated uh, for 500 years. And the Pope in Rome was the strongest figure in the... Bishop of Constantinople was the strongest figure in orthodoxy in the East. If we went to church back then, the Mass was in either Latin in the West or Greek in the East, uh, so we wouldn't understand it unless we learned that language, but then there would be some type of homily in the vernacular. And, and if we think about this fact, 95% of the population back then was illiterate. So when the Reformation occurred, most people couldn't read. They couldn't get other information except uh, orally from other people. So if we think about living in a, in a little town, which most of us would have lived in, the church was the center of life for each village. I mean, this is where life rotated around the church. Why? Because it was, it was, there was one religion. Everybody was the same religion. It was the nicest building. And if you went to mass and you knew everybody in the town, there aren't that many people. So if we think about it, the church was incredibly important socially back then because everybody was connected to it in one way or another because of just proximity, living in the villages. The church also owned 30 to 40 percent of many of the countries of Europe, including Germany. Well, you can imagine, I, I can't even imagine, a one church owning 30 or 40 percent of the state where we live in here in Minnesota. It would be uh, just so unbelievable to think one entity could own that much property. Well, because they had basically this huge uh, international business going, they had to have heavy taxes on all kingdoms in Europe, including Germany. 
This was an age during Martin Luther of uh, exploration. This is when the Spanish and the Portuguese were sailing around the globe, establishing colonies, getting riches from other countries. So Vasco da Gama, Christopher Columbus coming here. They were converting people, mainly by the sword, to Christianity, and they were getting wealth and bringing it back to Europe. Well, who was getting wealthy? Well, the leaders of Europe, the kings and the nobles and the, the bear, landlord barons, and also church uh, leaders. So you could see the peasantry, which was the vast majority of the population. This was an era of colonialism where they were crying out, please give us some wealth. They were upset. They were discontent. Could it be that this was the right time for a reformation? Germany, interestingly enough, was unlike uh, France or Spain in that it had very decentralized power. France and Spain had bureaucracies, uh, monarchies there, very top-down. Uh, the whole country was, had to be obedient to their monarchies. Germany, however, as one Lutheran that I heard here in Hibbing uh, say, they were pretty good at arguing with each other. And I'm mainly German myself, and I, do, I can attest that Germans are fairly uh, stubborn, strong-willed people. And they couldn't get along, and so the, the uh, nobles of Germany were always fighting each other, and by the time of Luther, they were starting to gather their own armies, and there was a lot of discontent, again, against the papacy, against the, the strong, uh, large monarchies of Europe. And so they were trying to get a piece of their wealth and not send it all off to the papacy. So they were fighting uh, amongst each other, kind of jockeying for position there in Germany, if you will. The Germans were probably the most, according to one historian, most energetic, jolly, and sensual of all the Europeans. Uh, beer drinking was a huge pastime there. Corruption was rampant. The Germans were known for being a bit of a cantankerous, but yet jovial people. <laughs> so what was happening in the church in the 1500s at the time of Luther. Well, at the time of Luther, there was the Pope was Leo X, and he was the son of a banker. When he in, became Pope, he inherited a full coffers uh, from the previous Pope who had accumulated a lot of money, but they had begun the construction of St. Peter's Church in Rome, which is to this day still the largest Christian church in the world. So that took a lot of money. Leo, being a banker's son, was fairly good with money, but he realized that he had to spend this money to build St. Peter's and to keep this huge empire, uh, business empire, social empire, uh, spiritual empire together. He wasn't all that much of a fan of um, St. Peter's himself, but he realized it had to be finished. And really, if we look at history, as one historian pointed out, Martin Luther arose at just a time when there was a pretty soft pope. He was a very educated person, loved the arts, and actually many in the uh, papacy wanted to put down Luther right away. He said, no, we need to give him a fair hearing. And he was a, uh, actually, as far as popes go in the Middle Ages, a fairly decent person. So this was what Martin Luther was born into. These were the social uh, settings that he um, was born into. He was born on November 10, 1483 to Hans and Greta Luther, but we call him Luther. He had six siblings, again, so a large family living in... Uh, pretty much poverty, but his father was very hard-working, actually worked in the mines. Uh, he can relate to people here along the Iron Range. Actually became uh, fairly wealthy uh, leasing out mine, mines uh, over time, and that's why Martin Luther was not illiterate and ended up going to university. But his father was not a churchgoer. His mother was very pious, however, was a praying woman, and probably as we look at history, we can see the effects of a praying mother for her children here. He had a very strict upbringing his parents uh, to discipline him used to beat him. In fact, at school, uh, school was even harsh. She got flogged 15 times one day for mispronouncing a noun in Latin class. This is a quote of his, the severe and harsh life I led with my parents was the reason that I afterward took refuge in the cloister and became a monk. <clears throat> well, before he became a monk, though, he went to university at Erfurt. His father wanted him to be a lawyer. So he went to uh, school there. While he was there, it is interesting, he heard William of Ockham's uh, teaching, who was already teaching um, from Britain, that popes and councils could err. So you could see that even in society, people were starting to question the doctrine of infallibility for the church, which the church had claimed for itself, that when they got together, prayed, uh, made any decisions, that there was no way the church could err, that everything they did was the voice of God. 
uh, for humans. But William of Ockham's teaching was already going around. This made an impression on Luther. He kind of stored it in the back of his mind. One day when he was on his way home, he was trapped in a thunderstorm. Uh, wasn't sure if he was going to survive. There was lightning all around. And he, he made a vow to St. Anne. He was praying to St. Anne, one of the saints, uh, that if he survived, he would dedicate himself to God and become a monk. Well, obviously, he survived. He became a monk. But let's just take a step back and let's look at his picture of God here. Uh, Jesus, by all accounts, was not a tender, compassionate um, judge of the last day. He was a wrathful judge of the last day. And you can see this somewhat in Martin Luther's upbringing, that there was very strict, very harsh. If you want to dedicate yourself to God, go be a monk. Um, so he was trying to appease this deity that was going to judge him in the end of times. And he would be confined in the monastery uh, to overcome every evil desire that he had. So he would lock himself half naked in cold cubicles, almost freezing himself to death. He would repeat prayers. He fasted. He scourged himself. He had lengthy confessions. One of his confessions went on for six hours as he confessed to the priest, you know, even about his motives. Well, why am I confessing this? It must be because I'm proud. And he would go on and on. And this is his quote. If ever a monk got into heaven by monkery, so should I also have gotten into heaven watching, praying, reading, and doing other work. So Martin... Out of all the monks, he viewed himself as a monk of monks. That if anybody should be saved through works and, and doing uh, devotions to God, it should be Martin Luther. Well, after he became a priest, he, he read some of John Huss's works, who was a Bohemian reformer about 100 years prior to Martin Luther. But he had been burned at the stake in Prague um, by, the, by the church at that time. And Martin read this book, and it was the wonderful Christian truth. And he wondered why a man who could write so Christianly and so powerfully had been burned. I shut the book and turned away with a wounded heart, according to Luther. So he was starting to desire, because he was starting to realize through all of his devotion to God that this wasn't satisfying him. In fact, even the other monks and even his supervisor realized he was a troubled soul. Johann von Stoppitz, it's interesting, God put somebody in his path, who was a provincial vicar of the Augustinian Eremites. And, and this man uh, took an interest in him because Martin was part of his uh, Augustinian uh, monk group. And he told him to turn from asceticism, that is these radical devotions to God. To, he said he should turn from that to Bible reading and the reading of St. Augustine, which, by the way, uh, Martin Luther loved St. Augustine and read him until his death, even after he became a reformer. Well, the monks at that time made a special effort to give him one of the best gifts they could ever give him, or the best gift. That is a Latin Bible. This was a rare commodity. So let's just back up here. Here Martin Luther gets a rare commodity, this Latin Bible. He's got the Bible now in his hands. Five, only 5% 5 of the people can read in Europe at that time. And out of that 5%, only a very tiny percentage of people have the Holy Scriptures in their tongue, or in a tongue they can read. In 1508 or 1509, nobody's quite sure when this was, but he was struck, he, he recalled that he read the sentence in Romans, the just shall live by faith. And he started to think about this faith, and just having faith in God, and His righteousness. But he was still wrestling with this doctrine of predestinationism that Augustine had, uh, and he couldn't figure out why it could, there could be these beautiful Christian truths like John Huss is saying, and like he's finding in Scripture that the just shall live by faith, and yet some people can inherit salvation because God has willed it, and other people go to hell forever and eternity uh, because God has willed that. And he was wrestling with this. He couldn't quite figure that out. How could God be so beautiful on one hand and so um, cruel and strict and arbitrary on, on the other hand? Well, in 1508, he moved to Wittenberg. He became a professor of physics and of logic and eventually theology. So I think it's worth noting that Martin Luther was a very educated uh, person for his time. And he was also educated in the skill of logic, which the Reformation became a very logical movement. And we'll look at that here in a minute. Wittenberg was a poor, insignificant town. It was the capital of its region there. But Luther described the inhabitants as beyond measure drunken, rude and given to reveling. Well, it's interesting that God would put him there, someone like putting Jesus in Nazareth, some place where uh, there's a lot of carousing, 
It's not known for its moral uprightness. And he would live there basically the rest of his life. In 1510, he made his trip to Rome. And as he entered Rome with his fellow monks, he cried, Hail to thee, O holy Rome. While there, he did all the devotions of a pilgrim. He bowed reverently before the relics, climbed the scale of Santa where Jesus had climbed on his, on his knees. He visited scores of churches. He later recalled that he earned so many indulgences that he almost wanted his parents <laughs> dead so that he could get them out of purgatory by the good uh, labor that he had produced there in Rome and getting indulgences for his uh, relatives. Later, however, he would call the trip an abomination as he saw the uh, poor being exploited. He saw the lavishness of the lifestyle of the priests. He saw the corruption that existed there and the lack of spirituality, lack of knowledge of God. Well, by 1517, the fact that he had a Bible, the fact that he'd been to Rome, the fact that he was desiring to have uh, a God that was loving and God that could grant him salvation by faith, it was on October 31 of 1517 when, right during the time when Leo X had sent Tetzel, who was a very accomplished fundraiser, to raise funds for the church. Now the ruler of Wittenberg didn't allow, actually, Tetzel to come into Wittenberg, so the, the Wittenberg residents were flocking to the countryside to, to get their, these indulgences uh, to get out of uh, purgatory. But again, Martin Luther was very upset by this because he could see, just as he saw in his trip to Rome, that this was taking advantage of poor people. This was not Bible religion. And on October 31, it boiled over and he wrote his 95 Thesis, most which, most which deal on justification by faith, and especially the doctrine of indulgences and purgatory, and getting people out of purgatory through the, giving money to the church. But I think it's good to uh, notice here that at this time Martin Luther never intended to separate from the church. He loved the church, wanted to see the church reform. He wanted to see the church grow in its understanding of scripture. And for the next three years, three and a half years, he preached. He himself said he was surprised by the overwhelming reaction that he was having. People were ready for it. And this is why I went into the history. You might wonder in a sermon, why did we go into so much history? This is why people were ready for it. They were all ready under the burden, taxation burden. They were poor. The church was exploiting them. The church was corrupt. And we need to mention here that Martin Luther and the Reformation, as, as the book Great Controversy points out, was popular at first. People believed what Martin Luther was saying. They believed it needed to be said. Now it got less popular as, as the rubber met the road and as people realized how much society, how much the church would need to change. But even within the church, people were excited about this new German professor from Wittenberg preaching these new truths. The church let it go for three and a half years. As I mentioned, Leo X was encouraged to, you know, uh, take stronger measures to curb the preaching of Martin Luther, but he did not. Finally, though, the church realized that this was almost like this earthquake shaking the foundations of the church. They needed to deal with this. And so on April 18, 1521, is when we have this famous quote of Luther as he's brought before the Diet of Worms and he's asked to recant all of his writings and, and say that the church was right in its doctrines of, of indulgences and doctrines of how people are saved through the church, through their devotion to God and giving back to God. April 18, 1521, Martin Luther said this, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason alone, for I do not trust either in the Pope or councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. So there he, he put himself in opposition to the church, uh, their understanding that they were infallible in the way they determined uh, their faith. He said, I am bound by the scriptures that I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Now sometimes we overlook one thing in this quote. As he said, if you can't prove to me from scripture, from reason, he was a teacher of logic. He realized that his reformation was really not that out there logically, per se. That the word of God, his conscience was captive to it. And he was preaching these beautiful truths and they were wonderful, they were logical. They were, people could understand them, people could grasp them. And he said, I cannot go against conscience, here I stand. 
Very famous quote. Well, the church didn't like that. They were going to take action to uh, get rid of Luther and the Lutherans. But in 1521, as he was leaving the Diet of Worms, his friends abducted him, took him to the Wartburg Castle, and there he stayed. He had time to translate the Bible, the New Testament, into German. This was a time he studied prophecy, when he studied especially Daniel 7 and the 1260-day prophecy when he was trying to figure out in his time period, was Christianity really the Antichrist? By the way, he said when he figured out Christianity was actually the Antichrist at the time, he said a huge burden was lifted from him because he couldn't figure out at that time, why is the church fighting him? He's trying to help the church. He's trying to bring the church back to the Bible. Well, his followers were excited too, and actually they got too excited. And there was a peasants' revolt. In fact, 5,000 priests in Germany were killed by the peasants. The peasants had been <clears throat> pushed down for so long, and all of a sudden Martin Luther, they have, a, they have a champion of Martin Luther, and all of a sudden they rise up, they begin to fight. Martin Luther had to disavow them because they went all the way to the other extreme, and they started to uh, brutally deal with uh, people in the church and Catholics. So they, weren't ups they were upset with him. So now people in the Reformation, all of a sudden it's kind of like open up this can of worms, and just all of a sudden everything starts going crazy. Well, by 1525, he was finally married to uh, Katharina von Bora, who actually ended up pretty much saving his life. His health was poor up until that time. He was living under duress. Uh, all the writing and the thinking he was doing, and he didn't eat properly. And uh, in fact, I went to a presentation Hibbing. They said he suffered so badly from constipation, he ended up creating a desk a toilet with a desk on it so he could write there as he just sat there on the toilet. And of course he recorded everything for history so that we all know that, probably too much sharing there. But from 1526 to 1529 he ended up organizing churches. He was trying to figure out how to not have a bureaucratic top-down church like he had just come out of. 1529 he wrote the large catechism. He laid out all the doctrines uh, for the Lutheran movement. And by 1534, he'd published the whole Bible in German. And by this time, once the people had the scriptures and <clears throat> the, the worship service in their native tongue, there was no turning back on the Reformation. And even though the Christian church was trying to do everything they could to uproot the Reformation, it was not possible. And on February 18, 1546, Martin Luther passed away. So what were the pillars of the Reformation? Why do we celebrate this year, 2017? Why are, we, why are we remembering it? Martin Luther got us back to sola scriptura. This is probably his big, biggest contribution. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, it wasn't that the church wasn't using the Bible at the time, but they used the Bible somewhat when they liked it, and then other things, if they didn't like it, they just created their own statements. And then if you quiz them, well, doesn't the Bible say this? They'd say, yes, but God has endowed the church that we have power over the Bible because we have power from the apostles, and therefore we don't need to go back to the Bible. Martin Luther said, no, we go back to the Bible, sola scriptura. Now, this is different from solo scriptura, and we'll talk about that next time a little bit more. So Lo Scriptura says we only read the Bible. And Martin Luther was a very educated person. He read widely. Uh, but he came to everything that he read with a biblical worldview. That is a sola scriptura worldview. And this is his great contribution, that he got people back to a biblical worldview. Sola gratia, we are saved only by grace. Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. This is a beautiful truth. Martin Luther understood it well because he had tried so desperately hard to earn his righteousness, to earn his indulgences, to earn favor with God, and he realized it was impossible. This is a gift from God, and Martin Luther was very grateful for it. He says when he realized that he was saved by grace, he said he was, it was worth dying a thousand deaths to realize Jesus had died for him and he loved him. Which leads us to the third thing we can thank Martin Luther and the Reformers for, for sola Christus, that only Christ is our mediator. You see, at that time, people were having to go through the church, through the priests. But 1 Timothy 2.5, Martin Luther read it, for there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. That is, who is our mediator? It's not St. Anne, it's not St. Matthew, it's not St. Peter, it's not St. Paul. It's not a priest, it's Jesus. We come to God through Jesus. Jesus. 
based on what Jesus did for us, based on his righteousness, the, the God-man. Sola fide, how do we access this grace? We already read Romans 1.17. This is what struck Rome, uh, Martin Luther in 1508. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So how do we access this? It's not by going to Rome. It's not by going to a priest. We just believe. We take God's word and we believe it and we act upon it. You know, interestingly enough, Martin Luther, because of his experience, especially with indulgences and purgatory, releasing people in this place that's not biblical, in between heaven and hell where you're somewhat purified, and if you're not good, you slip on into hell, and if you get purified, you go into heaven, and that's why you give indulgences to the church, you get your relatives, excuse me, up into heaven. He didn't, he, he understood the biblical understanding, Ecclesiastes 9.5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Next sermon, I'll have a, an actual quote where he compares death, which he had been deathly afraid of, no pun intended. And he said it was just a, a short sleep, like sleeping on a, on a sofa, awaiting the resurrection. He was giving peace and, and harmony to people that were uh, in, living in fear, living on, under this burden of not knowing uh, what was going to happen to them uh, after they died. Martin Luther also quoted that he's quoted as saying that he wanted the word priest to become as common as the word Christian. Now this was radical for the time. He read 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Back then it was very difficult to become a priest. You had to go through all these steps. You had to get ordained. And Martin Luther said, wait a minute, you all are priests. Now this would have been you know, a huge paradigm shift for people in the Middle Ages who were used to seeing the priests as being the educated ones, the ones who understood Latin, the ones who were, could uh, make the bread and the, and the wine into, into the body and blood of Christ, the ones that were able to forgive sins. And all of a sudden, Martin Luther comes and says, wait a minute, Jesus died so that you could have become a priest. You, men and women, would be priest to God. I heard an interesting, uh, and we'll close on this one, because really, if you think about it, all of these, what we're talking about, is a huge paradigm shift for people in the Middle Ages. And the Reformation really had long-term effect, not just on religion, but on society. Why? Because in Luke 17, 21, Jesus said this. I'll read from the King James, because I think it's the best translation of this text. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That is, where was Jesus establishing his kingdom? Now, the disciples always thought, they, they were hoping for this literal, visible kingdom. But Jesus said, wait a minute, the kingdom of heaven is within you. It's when your heart is changed, when you understand God's love for you, when you have a new heart and a new spirit and a new desires in life. This is the kingdom of God. It is an internal kingdom. Now, what had happened by the time of Martin Luther? It had gone back to being an external kingdom. The, the church, as we mentioned before, was the largest building in town. It was the church of God. And you walk in it and you have reverence. But then you go outside and you sin, you come back and then you confess your sins. Martin Luther understood that the kingdom of God is inside of you. That's why everybody becomes priests. That's why everybody accesses God's grace through his one mediator, through faith, outside of just the church building, church walls, church structure. By that time, the church had voted on officially that God only worked through the church, that God wasn't active outside of the church. Martin Luther and the reformers understood that they, they did not place uh, a lot of emphasis on church structure and the visible church. They understood the main church is the church within you, the kingdom of God within your heart. But if you think about it, so here's the paradigm shift. The church was between the individual and God. Martin Luther took the church and he flipped it upside down so that the church didn't uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the person didn't exist for the church. The church existed for the individual. That's a huge paradigm shift. That is to say the church was more important than the people because the people live in poverty, but they brought their, their, their meager uh, 
income to the church and the church would collect it all and then they would live lavishly. That is, everybody lived, just, just uh, existed to help the church prosper. Well, Martin Luther and the Reformation turned that upside down and all of a sudden the church exists not just to exist and prosper, but so that the individuals will prosper. This is a huge paradigm shift. This allowed people to have joy in their religion, to understand that religion exists for the individual. The church exists for the individual. Now just think of what this effect this had on society. If you look at what happened in society in France and in our country, within a couple hundred years of Martin Luther, we have a government for the people, by the people, created by people, run by people, where the rule of law is greater, where the government exists for the people so that they can pursue life and health and happiness. And they can, they can exi not just exist, but prosper. And who founded America? For the most part, Protestants. People that were used to thinking like this, that had that medieval way of thinking changed where all of a sudden the individual is important because we're created in the image of God, because God loves the individual. And the church only is there to help the individual rise. This evening, or wherever you might be, when you go to read your Bible in your own language that you understand, when you can kneel down in your house and worship how you pray to the God of heaven or you can worship any God really because of religious freedom in this country that the Protestants gave to people. Why? Because of God's love for the individual, because of God's love of freedom, of having people serve him out of freedom. We can thank Martin Luther, we can thank the other reformers, the people that have gone before us, that have fought for these principles, that have taken the sola scriptura viewpoint and the understanding of God's salvation for mankind and have given this, this legacy that we are to continue. Next time, we'll pick this up and we'll look at how does the Reformation continue in our day. May God bless us as we continue the Reformation until Jesus comes again.